pronunciation because you know the word, but you're not sure how to pronounce it. So consult a dictionary if in doubt, and drill yourself to look up the pronunciation of words you don't know. Thank you. 
English we have no R sound in the word per when it's said on its own. In American English you have an R sound going right through per. American cats per. <laughs> uh, British cats per. <laughs> but neither of them make the noise of a French per. Right, so by looking at these details and understanding the phonetic differences, we can help the learner to home in on the problem and tackle the problem, whatever it is, aspiration, lip position, inappropriate art sounds. Let's take another example. Vowel sound. In English, we have three vowels, e, a, a. They're all different. They cause the word to have different meanings, as we can see when we compare a bed that you sleep in, bad, not good, and bud on a tree or a flower. Bed, bad, bud. So English, in this particular part of the vowel system, has three vowels. Many languages, though, don't have three vowels like those. And this may give rise to problems. So, English has three vowels, but many languages have got only two. And then they're faced with the problem that probably two of the English vowels sound very similar. And they want to map two different English vowels onto one of their own vowels. So, in uh, some languages you have an e and an a. people whose first language is Spanish or Japanese might be tempted to say bed, bal, bal, both the same. Or if we're being Japanese, bed, bal, bal, both the same. And there they have the problem then of distinguishing, learning to make the difference between bad and bal, bad and bal being different. Is this a summer course or is it a summer course? It's a summer course, and it's an important difference. Others, for example, speakers of German, Polish, and Russian, typically hear the English vowels of bed and bad as the same thing. Bed, 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 I sleep on a bed. Uh, it's, it's very bed. Uh, <coughs> I use a very strong German accent. Uh, but it's quite different, that's not a problem. So, speakers of these languages have to learn to hear and make the difference between bed and bed. Now, this is a twofold problem. It's a problem, yes, in pronouncing the sounds, but also, very importantly, it's a problem in hearing the sounds. We all hear everything through the filter of our own first language unless we've learnt not to. That's why we give you ear training, because it's important for you to learn to listen carefully and to hear the differences that exist in English, even though they may not all exist in your own first language. There are various <coughs> kinds of error that we can recognize. The most important category, known as phonemic errors, involve a failure to distinguish the phonemes of the target language of English in this case. That is, failure to, dist to distinguish bed from bad or bad from bad, where it's going to make a difference to the meaning of the word. Because you're failing to signal a particular contrast, this may lead to confusion when you speak. More importantly, if you can't hear a contrast, you may have difficulty understanding the native speaker. So here's another example for Korean. Koreans, like uh, Filipinos, have
have a problem distinguishing p from f. We have pairs of words in English like pin and fin. They mean different things. In the Korean classroom, the beginners will want to say pin, pin, for both of them. And they have to learn to hear this difficult contrast and then also to make it. There are other errors which we can call phonetic errors, which are not so serious. They involve a failure to get the sounds exactly right. Even though you're making the distinctions, you might think, nevertheless you're not doing it in quite the right way. All the things that add up to a foreign accent belong in one of the categories that I'm presenting to you here. And like other elements of foreign accent, phonetic errors uh, obviously can be tolerated by other people, by native speakers and by speakers of other languages using English. But if there are too many of them, they cause a problem. Why? Well, they can be irritating because they demand extra effort from the listener to work out what you're saying. They can be distracting. If I have to concentrate to work out what you mean, then that distracts me from concentrating on your message. If you say to me, where do you leave? Well, first of all, I hear leave at the end, but that doesn't make sense. Where do you leave? Doesn't make sense. So, you must have meant, where do you live? Or did you mean, when did you leave? I have to somehow make a decision about that kind of thing, which uses up my mental powers, so I can't concentrate on listening to what you're saying and paying attention to it. That's why this is not a good thing to do. Uh, it can also be amusing, uh, which may be fine, or it may mean that you sound ridiculous, which is not what you want. So an example of this, uh, unlike the Japanese, the Koreans don't have a problem pronouncing L sounds, but they don't necessarily make them sound very English. So the word pull, as we say in English, to pull on a rope, typical Korean pronunciation would be pull, pull. And pull on a rope, and that's that's not quite right, but we understand it. Or another example applies to Koreans and also to Chinese. Uh, in a word like speed, speed, high speed. Even though in those languages there is an appropriate but sound available, Koreans and Chinese tend to say speed, speed, with aspiration. We look at this when we talk about aspiration but it's inappropriate in this position after S. So those are phonemic errors. And the third category we need to worry about are what I call phonotactic errors. These are errors to do with syllable structure, to do with the place where sounds occur. You could make the sound, but you can't make it in the right place or in the right combinations. English has rather complicated syllables. That is to say, many English syllables begin not with one consonant, but with several consonants. Many English syllables end with a consonant, or indeed with several consonants. And depending on your first language, this may be a problem. One of our difficulties running a course like this is that one person's problem is not a problem at all to somebody else. It all depends upon your first language. So, uh, shall we say, Germans or Russians don't have problems pronouncing str in strong. Well, they might have little problem problems to begin with. But in general, it, the idea of having three consonants is not in itself difficult. But speakers of Spanish or Arabic, certainly Japanese, yes, are going to have problems with a word like strong. So, typical Spanish solution might be estro, 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 
she is as a, a strong man <laughs> instead of is a strong man because in Spanish you have the habit of supporting such clusters by putting a vowel in front I come from Spain instead of I come from Spain the Japanese habit on the other hand is to separate out the various consonants with a, an extra vowel. So something along the lines of strong. It might not really be a big vowel, you won't get suturo, but you might have stro, 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 and all that going on there. Uh, it's very difficult for Japanese people to think of strong as one syllable. It feels to them like suturo, <laughs> four syllables. So this is a partly a mental problem. You have to look at things in a different way and learn to see it from an English point of view as a single syllable. Strong. Okay, interference. Various kinds of interference. Well, uh, just look at the <coughs> summary on the handout. Just to run over those points. Section 2 on the handout. We've got listening, recognizing the sounds. That's why we give you ear training. And we've got speaking, that's producing the sounds, production. And so we have drills and so on for that. Transitive analysis tells us which matters are likely to be most troublesome. And we've looked at some, some examples of that. Uh, the last point in that paragraph is that you may have to unlearn some of the things that you do in your native language to unlearn them because they're inappropriate in English. It's not just a matter of learning new things, it's also a matter of unlearning old things. In particular, unlearning muscular habits. You have to coordinate muscles and muscular movements in different and new ways. Now, I thought the other thing we could do this morning that would be useful would be, again, to look at some of the things that are very familiar to you but tend to get overlooked by those who think only of the writing and don't think of the pronunciation. And this concerns, first of all, the English plural ending, the regular plural. There's a cat. There's a dog, there's a horse. And then underneath, you can see some cats, some dogs, and some horses. Well, how do we make the regular plural in English? The rule you learn first probably is about writing, and it tells you to add the letter S, or sometimes, occasionally, ES. But the rule in pronunciation is not quite the same as that. Because if we look at it carefully, we can see we add different things for those three words. Cat to cats. Dog to dogs. Horse. I say it was three dogs, wasn't it? Horse for horses. Is, is, is. And the choice between these three possibilities has a very simple explanation. What we have to do is to look at the last sound, not the last letter, but the last sound of the stem, of the singular form. If the last sound is voiceless, then we add voiceless So we add cats. If the last sound is voiced, dog, g, 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 voiced, then we add voiced z, giving dogs. The dogs are barking. But there's a special exception. If the last sound is a sibilant, there are the sibilants in green, those are the sounds. If the last sound is a sibilant, then we add an extra vowel. Some people add a, some people add a, doesn't matter, giving us 
horses or horses. And so the word then gets an extra <coughs> syllable. Sibilants give you syllables. There are more examples on the handout, where you also see that this applies not just to the plural <coughs> suffix, but also to the possessive, written with apostrophe <coughs> S, to the uh, plural possessive, written S apostrophe, to the contracted form with is or has, written with apostrophe S, all of them pronounced in the same way, lips, laughs, carrots, cats, or voiceless, things, loves, goes, dogs, or voiced, horses, wishes, causes, or siblings. <coughs> and then on the handout, we also have the rather similar rule for the past tense and past participle, which again is voiceless after a voiceless sound, miss, gives you missed, t -t -t -t. laugh, gives you laugh, Finish gives you finished. I heard an international diplomat on the radio a few days ago saying we had finished it. Not we had finished it. No, we had finished. He didn't know this rule. This is a very basic rule. This is a very elementary rule. What a tragedy that someone whose English was really very, very good in all sorts of other ways didn't know this basic rule of pronunciation. You will all know it. <laughs> After voice sounds, we add de, plan, plan, rub, rub, carry, carry. When do we add an extra syllable? Well, for the past participle, past tense, it's after T and D. So wait, waited, grade, graded, paint, painted. Question. You know the verb to breathe. I'm breathing in and out. We're all breathing, I hope. <laughs> all right. I breathe, you breathe, he or she. Now, do we add an extra syllable or not? Breathe. Is that a sibilant? No. So, no extra vowel. He breathes. More one syllable. He breathes. She breathes. Today, I breathe. Yesterday, I breathed. Again, more one syllable. Breathed. Get you to hear them not just. 
just on their own, but also in combinations, in clusters, to pray, to play. Are they playing? No, they're praying. Are they praying? Yes. Are they praying? Yes. Are they playing? No. Okay. <coughs> this, is, this one is for the Spanish speakers as well. Okay, this is a boat. This is a vote. Is this vote? No. Is it vote? Is it boat? Yes. Is it boat? Yes. Is it boat? No. Is it boat? Yes. Is it boat? Yes. Is it boat? No. Good, well done. <laughs> now, you can also do this with one another or with native speakers of English. You mustn't let what you learn finish in the classroom. If you have difficulties with R and L, write, write, correct, collect, then you can experiment if you have access to a native speaker of English like your tutor. You can try it out and you say, correct. You're not sure that the native speaker will say, yeah, that one was whichever it was. Point to it. And in this way you can Try what works and what doesn't work, and find out where you can safely place your targets on in order to get the result that you wish for. This is a, an experimental process. It requires your active collaboration. You're not here to sit back in the lecture or to sit back in the class and let it wash over you. You've got to engage actively, listening, learning to improve your powers of auditory discrimination, to hear the difference between one sound and another, learning to hear better, and then also to pronounce better, to perform the vocal gymnastics. Now, we shall use uh, a large number of technical terms of one kind and another. Some of you have already, now have a look at the handout towards the bottom, section 4 on the handout, where I thought we ought to go through some of the basic terminology which we shall be using. Okay, articulation then is the production of speech sounds using the speech organs to modify the airstream that is set in motion by the lungs. And we classify consonants well, in three ways, two of which are the place and manner of articulation. <coughs> place of articulation concerns the place where we make an obstruction in our mouth when we're producing a sound. <coughs> so if you take the sounds b, 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 as you can see by looking, they're made with the two lips, b, 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 we call them bilabials, lower lip and upper lip. The sounds f and v, on the other hand, are made with the lower lip and the upper teeth. Lower lip, upper teeth. A picture of that somewhere. There we are. So this is a cross-sectional diagram. Face diagrams, we call it, showing the two lips in contact for p, a pin, pan, pig. Compare that with the labiodental, the lower lip, upper teeth of pin, pan, pig. Looking at this kind of picture, which you'll find in all the reference textbooks, of course, is useful to make sure you've got your organs of speech in the right position. TH sounds are called dentals because for them we place our tongue tip against the teeth. Thing this. T d n n s z. A little bit further back, alveolus. Tip. R tr dr. Further back still.
still, post alveolar, ch, 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 different arrangements. Some people call that post alveolar. We still call it on the whole palato alveolar. Yeah, palatal, k, k, n. Going further back, you can't easily see this. Velar, back of the tongue and the heart, and the soft palate. W, double articulation, lips, and back of the tongue, labial velar. H sound, hand, and glottal stop made in the glottis, that's in the throat, in the larynx, they're called glottals. That's places of articulation. Just to remind those of you who know it already, those of you who are coming, coming upon it for the first time, we'll do it bit by bit. Manners of articulation is the second dimension, where we can either make a complete closure, blocking the flow of air, giving us plosives, but we can have a narrowing where the air continues to escape. Fricatives. Combination of plosive and fricative gives us affricate. Nasals have the air escaping continuously through the nose. Soften that down. R and L are liquids. They have a peculiar articulation that's separate from all of the rest. Yeah, and what are semivowels made like vowels? Those are two of the dimensions. I said there are three dimensions. What's the third dimension? Voicing. We looked at that when we were looking at plurals and past tenses. Let's look at it again. If we take the sounds s and z, they differ in voicing. S is voiceless. Z is voiced. The easiest way to observe this for yourself is to cover your ears with your hands. Now, I'm going to ask you to do this and you must do it aloud. Don't whisper to yourself, do it aloud. So everybody, make a zzz, <coughs> go on, zzz, and cover your ears. You can hear that buzz in your ears. For no buzz. Alternate them. You can hear the difference between the two. So that's our third dimension, voiceless or voiced. So now, all of these things we shall come back to. That's just a quick introduction. That's really the end of the first lecture, but before you go away,